Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the priority that must be in the husband and the wife and the child of God and Christ. And this morning we are blessed to be able to be here this morning to spend time in worship unto God and to be able to open up his book. And this morning I lament the fact that my wife is homesick. You truly realize how much you struggle on your own when your wife's not with you, so you make it as best as you can. And I'm glad that she's able to be home to recover. Our other son, Colson, is at home sick as well, so keep them in your prayers. And I, I greatly miss them. But, you know, I was thinking about that as we were singing the opening song about how much our dependence on each other is. And even greater, how much our dependence must be on Christ. And that's the beautiful thing taking place in Ephesians chapter 5, starting about verse 21, going to the end of the chapter. But today, for just a few moments of your time, I would like us to lend our minds to talk about something that I believe we need to focus on for just a little bit of our time every year. We need to talk about how we can be a servant. You see, what we need to recognize is how we can help others. And I believe that there are a variety of different ways in which we can help others. And one of those ways I want you to see, or one of the things I want you to see, comes from Matthew chapter 20, if you'll turn there. And notice with me about verse 20, as Jesus is having this discussion with some people, and someone came up and asked Jesus if their sons could be on the right and the left of Jesus. And Jesus goes on to explain to them that they don't quite understand everything they're asking, and that they're not going to be able to do some of the things that he's going to do. But I want you to pick up with me in verse 25. Because what takes in place in this particular section is the request that comes in verses 20 and 21 from the mother. The response that Jesus gives to the sons, verses 22 through 24. But I want you to see the reality of what's taking place of what Jesus is describing. Verse 25, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever be chief among you, let him be your servant. And notice very intently, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I want you to look at that word, but to minister. If you'll go and look at that word in its original form, it will read this way, but to be a servant. You see, Jesus Christ did not come to this earth to have all the riches of this earth. Jesus Christ did not come to this earth so that everyone else could serve him, everyone else could minister to his needs. But Jesus Christ came to this earth to be a servant. And we start to see the reality of servanthood if we apply that to Jesus Christ, don't we? Especially as we follow out verse 28. And to give his life a ransom for many. You see, when we begin to look at any subject, I think it's appropriate to consider Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ should be the example that all of us are looking to. He should be the center point in our lives. He should be the one we are affixed to. He should be the one that we are aspiring to be like. And in this particular scene, we realize that he says, I'm a servant. And he shows us how far he's willing to take this concept of servanthood. All the way to being a ransom for many. So the question becomes, how can we as God's people be servants to others? How can we minister to our communities and I think there are three things that come to our mind this morning, or at least came to my mind as I was preparing this lesson. Number one, you've got to know your master. If you're going to be a servant, you've got to know the one that you serve. You've got to know what he would do. You've got to know how he thinks. Number one, to be a servant, I've got to know who Jesus is. Number two, to be a servant, I've got to know your business. You've heard this phrase, mind your business. Well, I want to introduce you to a new phrase this morning. You've got to know your business. You've got to know who you are as a child of God. You must know your responsibilities as a child of God, and therefore you must know what you're supposed to be doing in this world. You've got to know your business. But in the third place today, and maybe in the most valuable place today, we've got to know our value. 
To be a servant that belongs to Christ, to be a servant of this world, I've got to know my value. And you can already see where this is going. It goes back to Christ. Why did Jesus Christ come to this earth? Well, Luke 19.10 says, to seek and to save that which was lost. John 3.16 tells us, because we needed Him to be our sacrifice, to be the one that could pay the penalty for our sin, to be the one of which is our value. So know your master, know your business, and know your value as you start studying how we can help others. Let's begin by looking at know your master. And to do this, go with me to John chapter 13. And how we're going to follow our thought process this morning is we will look at three different sections of Scripture, all of which have to do with this idea of being a servant. Now, in John chapter 13, we're going to recognize that I've got to know who I serve. And this is an account you've probably read many times before because verses 1 through 3 is going to tell us that in John chapter 13, this was a regular everyday meal. Pick up with me in verse 13 of the Passover at least. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. What I want you to notice is very simple today. Here was a setting of a meal. And here is Jesus with his disciples. And what you find in verse 2 is there was an idea that had been planted into the mind of Judas. And you know how this is going to play out as you look at the New Testament. Judas is going to betray Jesus. And that's ultimately going to lead Jesus into the hands of those who are going to put him on the cross. But what's happening here in this scenes is what I want you to see of you and me. It's a regular meal. We would be in the place of regular people. We would not know what was in the heart of Judas. And here this meal has come to an end, and Jesus knows these things, and He knows He's going to have to go back to the Father. He's the one that sent Him, and He's the one that He's going to return to. But pick up with me in verse 4. This is where things get interesting. Jesus rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Now pause for just a minute. Can you imagine sitting at a table with Jesus? And here you've been following with him as his disciple. You've been with him through thick and thin. You've seen the miraculous things that he could do. You've seen who he is as the very Son of God. And here you are sitting at a meal, and as the meal was preparing to end, he gets up and and he gets a towel and he girds it around himself as if he were preparing to do something. And verse 5, he pours water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This would have been a common practice of meals of the day, usually in various forms and in various times throughout the meal process. But here's Jesus, the very Son of God, And as you're sitting at a meal with him, he gets up, he pours water into a bowl, he he takes the towel that he's girded with himself, and he on his knees, he washes your feet. You see, to you and I, we don't have a lot of significance to washing feet because we live in a different time. We live in a time where shoes are readily available, where the dusty roads are not that which we walk on every day to get where we're going. The conditions of life have changed. But here this need was was to be met. And look at who gets up to serve. All of those sitting at the table could have gotten up to serve, but Jesus is the master teacher. And I'll suggest to you that in John chapter 13, Jesus shows himself as the master teacher. Because he gets up in silence, he prepares in silence, and he begins to wash feet in silence, showing them what they were supposed to be. You see, here's a real servant. He gets up without being asked. He gets up and does without anything going on. But what I want you to see is the great lesson. And this happens at verse 12, if you pick up with me, because verses 7 down to verse 12, Peter is going to have what we always call foot and mouth disease because Peter speaks before he thinks. And he, in essence, forbids the Lord to do this, and the Lord's going to explain to him that's not how it's going to be. But you pick up in verse 12, I want you to see what happens here. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments 
and was set down again, he said unto them, now notice this, verse 12, Know ye what I have done unto you. Verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so am I. Pause for just a minute. Jesus asked them, Do you know what I've done for you? The natural answer of this is, You washed my feet. But it's much deeper than that. Because Jesus has done more than wash their feet. He says, you call me Lord and Master, and He says, you've done that right because that's who I am. And you know the reality of that is the only person that can say He is the true Master is Jesus Christ. You and I can't say that. The disciples could not say that. Jesus can say that. He says, verse 14, If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you that the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he is that sent him greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So, so what's the great lesson today? I would suggest to you that the great lesson is not teaching them that he is Jesus Christ. They already knew that. They already admitted that. Jesus even responds to the fact that they called him Lord and Master and said, you're doing that right. But he gives them the lesson of servanthood. And I've entitled this point, You've Got to Know Your Master. Because you cannot be a servant until you know the true servant. And here's Jesus teaching them this lesson. And you notice what he said in verse 12, Know ye what I've done to you? And the proverbial answer, the rhetorical answer is no, they don't know what he's done to them yet, but he's about to explain it to them. He's Jesus Christ. He's about to go to the cross for, to them. The hour is almost come for him. And what does he do? He gets that towel and he girds it about his loins. He gets that basin of water and he fills it up. And he washes their feet because he's their master. And he teaches them the lesson. Verse 15, For I have given you an example that you have or should do as I have done to you. I want to suggest to you today that if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you can't begin to be an effective servant of Jesus Christ because you've got to know your master. Here's what Jesus did for you and me. He left the realm of heaven, the realm where God is that we cannot begin to understand because we're in this realm. He left a place that was perfect. He left a place that was pure. He left a place that was sinless. And guess what? He came to a place that was imperfect because of you and me. He came to a place that was filled with sin because of you and me. And what does He do? He washes people's feet as a true servant. The question I have for you is, will you wash the feet of those who are in need? Now, no, I'm not asking you to go out on the street corner and offer a free foot washing. But will you be a servant? Will you see the need that others have? But here's what I'm asking you to do, and this is a very complex thing. Will you be the example to help others? You see, sometimes all it takes is one person to stand up and be a servant for other people to stand up and be servants as well. You know, a great characteristic of leaders is not their speech. It's their actions. And this is Jesus here. Do you know what I've done for you? Here's what he did. He showed them how to serve. And he did so quietly, respectfully, and thoroughly as he began to start. So you've got to know your master, and we've got to ask this question. Will we wash the feet of those who are in need in our society? In the second place, you've got to know your business. And to do that, I need you to go with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I want you to see a family event that's taking place here in Luke chapter 2. If you'll go with me all the way down to verse 41 to pick up in this particular scene. And I want you to see Jesus as a younger man. And, and I want you to see a family that's going about to do as they were supposed to. But I want you to see a great search and and I want you to see the essence of a true life because not only do we need to be concerned about spiritual service, physical service, we need to be concerned about spiritual service as well. And this picks up in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Pause for just a minute. 
parents, may I talk to you directly, and grandparents and great-grandparents, and however you may be connected to children, do you see what you can be? Do you see verse 41? Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. Do you know who leads children? It's adults. And there's something that I've recognized, that you've recognized, that we all know and we just don't talk about very often, but children usually learn from those that are around them. Whether it be other children or it be the adults that they look up and aspire to be in this life. Do you see the parents of Jesus? Every year when it was time for them to observe this feast, where were they? They were there. Let me ask you this question. When it's time to observe the spiritual feast, Will we be there, parents? Grandparents, will we be there? I think it goes past parents and grandparents, don't you? I'll tell you something of my son, and it's the sweetest thing he's ever said. We pulled into the parking lot on a Tuesday night, and, and he didn't quite recognize what day it was, but he looked over at me and he said, but where are all the people? Children really look up to everybody that's around them, don't they? We're all examples. And here is Jesus, and here are His parents, and they're there. Verse 42, And when He was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. This was a 70-mile trek from Nazareth where they were. And we see, And when they had fulfilled the days they were returned, the child Jesus tarried behind, his, or behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it, as you stop in verse 43. Here's the great family event. It was time to worship, and they were there. But you see, Jesus being of his age at this time, and we see his age in verse 42, he was 12 years old, he tarries behind. And, and no one knows that at the time. No one sees that at the time. But a great search begins in verse 44. But, but they suppose him to have been in the company when a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintances. I, I love that phrase, their kinfolks and acquaintances. Who are our kinfolks and acquaintances? Do the people that we associate with as people of God, are they good associations? Do you know who, in this particular scene, Joseph and Mary spent their time with? Number one, their family, their kinfolk. But number two, these acquaintances. Where were these acquaintances going? Well, they had already been to the Passover feast, and they're on their way back home, 70 miles journey. Look at who their acquaintances are. Good, godly people. But verse 45, this is the great search. They found him not and they turned back again to Jerusalem. Now notice these two words, seeking him. Have you ever thought you lost your child? You ever thought that? Have you ever lost your child? Nobody's really willing to admit that one. At our food giveaway, Charlie was here. and Colson was here. Colson was in his uh, little, little cart that I call. He can't get out of it. But Charlie has legs. We've learned that's a problem. And I thought I lost him once. And let me tell you, my heart sank. And I was searching for him. Do you see the despair of these parents? They're searching for their child. But here's where Jesus is, because he is a true lie for us. You get with back into verse 46. They're seeking him, verse 45. It comes to pass after three days. Do you notice it? Three days. They find him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Here's Jesus. He's 12 years old. And look at the understanding and answers he has. I believe this is one of the passages that should tell us that our children can do great things. That they can learn big things. They can understand great concepts. Here's Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. And people were astonished at him. Because he was a true life as you follow out in verse 46. And you see all these things. And I want you to see verse 49. Here's the mindset of Christ at 12. How is it that ye have sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? Oh, the great things that were involved in this life. Jesus Christ knew His business. And there He was in the midst of the synagogue teaching and asking questions. But, but here's the question that comes to us. Will we work 
for an understanding and answers. In this life, we've got to know our business And I want to suggest to you that sometimes being a servant does not mean taking your hands, girding with a towel, and getting the bowl of water. Sometimes it means knowing your business. That was Jesus at the age of 12 in the temple with the doctors and the lawyers, with those who were highly intelligent. But he knew his business. I ask you a question this morning. Do you know your business? You see, I expect a banker to know his business. I expect a mechanic to know his business, but I want to tell you something else that I expect. And it's something I expect of myself, and it's something that I'll tell you I expect of you. I expect a Christian to know his business. We've got to let go of the foolishness of the world. Do you see Jesus here? He asked them this question, do you not know that I'm about my father's business? Did you not know this? And the question sometimes we have to ask ourselves is, do we know what our business is? Do we know that we have to be about our heavenly Father's business? Are we seeking others to come to Christ? Are we seeking opportunities to serve? But I think in the point that's being here in Luke chapter 2, are we seeking after understanding and answers? Because the greatest thing we can do is be about our Father's business and know our business. Point number three. You've got to know your value. You've got to know your value. To do this, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to see another scene of a servant. And this particular scene is probably one of my favorite parables that Jesus gives. Because there's a question that happens as you begin in verse 21, and it's a question that you and I sometimes may ask, and it has to do with our value. Here's the question. It's Peter that asked this, and It reads this way, verse 21. Now Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. I think we need to recognize that Peter asking this question had to have realized this or reasoned this out in his mind. Because I think you know this as much as I know this, but if Jesus was standing in this room and we ask him a question, it wouldn't be a question off the top of our head. He had this reason down. How oft shall I forgive my brother that sinned against me? Shall seven times be sufficient? He reasoned it out. And, and this was the question. How often do I forgive? Let me ask you this. How often do you forgive? But it picks up in verse 22. Jesus says, I say unto thee until seven times, but until seven times seventy. In other words, you keep forgiving, and you keep forgiving, and you keep forgiving. That's how often we forgive our fellow brother who has sinned against us. Now the question is why? Because there's a value to the soul, isn't there? And that's what we need to recognize today. And he begins this in verse 22 and follows this down. He says, there was a man, in verse 23, there's a kingdom. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which took account of his servants, verse 24. He began to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, a number that could never be repaid in life. Not at the salary this man would have been making. And he had not to pay, verse 25, and his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. It was time to be reckoned with the master. But verse 26 is very important. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. And I will repay thee all. But look at verse 27. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him of and forgave him the debt. And that servant, verse 28, as you know, went out. And he found someone that owed him a debt that was much smaller, that could have been repaid with the proper amount of time. And he sent him to those that would require him of his time to repay him. He put him in prison, verse 30, till he should pay the debt. But you see, this master found out, this Lord, verse 32, found out and called him. You follow in the middle of verse 32, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Now look at verse 33. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And you see what happened to him, verse 34. He was was put into the place of that other man till he should pay his debt which was due him. And he was put into the position 
or put into the ownership of the tormentors. But what I want you to see is the application. This is verse 35, and, and this is how you can know your value. This is how I can know my value. Verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Do you see the value of forgiveness that shows you your value? Think about this for just a minute. How have we been forgiven? Because of Jesus Christ. How can we be forgiven of our sins? Because of Jesus Christ. Where can we find forgiveness? In Jesus Christ. And look at what he says to us here in verse 35. The heavenly Father will likewise do also unto us if we will forgive every, every one who has trespassed or sinned against us. In other words, I've got to know my value in the scheme of forgiveness. And to do that, I've got to know my value of my soul. Now, there are a lot of things that are valuable in this world. A lot of people say money's valuable, but, you know, money's really backed by gold, isn't it? That has not changed. There are a lot of things that are valuable in this world. Sometimes buildings become very valuable. Sometimes they're sentimental, but sometimes they're very valuable monetarily. Sometimes businesses become very valuable, and you see them selling for billions and billions of dollars, and we think, wow, how successful is that? Sometimes people become very valuable because of their success they've had in business, and their personal wealth is very high. Billionaires, think of that. I can't think of what you would do with a billion dollars, can you? But some people have billions of dollars, and we look at them and we say, wow, wow, so valuable. But think of yourself for just a minute and think of your soul and think about how valuable that soul is because what we do in this life determines the next, the eternal life. And here this man who was a servant, he had a debt forgiven him, but he could not forgive the debt of the other servant. And the Lord called him on that. And the Lord tells us that if we're not willing to forgive others, neither is the Father willing to forgive us. You've got to know your value. So that brings us to this question. Will you forgive your brother their trespasses? We're not perfect people. Matter of fact, I would ask the question, but it's void of being asked. Stand up if you're perfect. And you and I both know that I would have to sit down. And I know you would not stand up either. Let me tell you, what we do in this life matters. And that's because we have a soul. And it has an eternal value. And there are decisions that must be made in this life. You've got to know your master. Will you get that bowl of water, that basin of water? Will you get that towel? Will you gird up your loins? And will you go about being a servant physically? Will you know your business? Will you know the Lord's business and will you be lost in doing it? Now, I don't mean lost as in eternal damnation lost. But will you be so immersed in the Lord's business that no one can find you three days because you're about the Father's business? And then will you know your value? You know, forgiveness reminds us of our value. If I can be forgiven, should I not forgive others? Do we see the weight that's been given for us? If we were the only, ones to die, or the only ones to sin, Jesus Christ would still go to the cross for you and me. Look at the weight, the value of your soul. And will I be someone who understands the values of the other soul and be a servant in forgiveness? You see, what we've got to do in this life is we've got to be a servant. And we have to find ways inside of this life that we can help others, that we can be involved in soul-changing, eternity-changing work. A lot of ways you can do that. You have to find a way you can do that. I know you can. I know every one of us can study God's Word, can't we? I know we can do it that way for sure. You may not have the strength physically to be that type of servant, and that's understandable, but we can all be spiritual servants. And we certainly can be servants of forgiveness, can't we? And do that for one another as we need that. What a blessing it is to be a Christian because we follow after Christ who gave us, as we started in Matthew chapter 20, the ultimate example of being a servant. How are you this morning? Are you the servant that you're supposed to be? I want you to do something this morning as we conclude this lesson. I, 
I, I want you to be a little bit selfish. I know I don't ask you to do that very often. And that certainly has your attention, doesn't it? I want you to be selfish for just a moment. And I want you to serve your own soul for just a second. And I want you to answer one question. Am I going to heaven? Am I going to heaven? See, just as much as we must serve others, I must also, Luke 9, 23-25, take up my cross daily and follow Him. Are you and I willing to serve our souls this morning? Maybe it's the case that you're in this room and you need to become a child of God. You can do that this morning. You can obey the Lord. And you do so by listening to His Word, Romans 10, 17. It all depends on God's Word. Maybe you need to become a child of God this morning. You can. Maybe you're a child of God this morning and you recognize that you need to come back to the Lord, that you need to serve your soul, that you need to serve your soul back to the Lord. Jack has picked out a song for us to sing, and what a blessing it is to sing that song, don't you think? To have an opportunity to respond to the Lord. That's the occasion we find ourselves in. So just a moment, you just think about this question. Am I going to heaven? And you respond accordingly as we all stand and sing.